All right, here we go. Nitromethane, woo, let's put a bit in here. It's enough to cover the bottom of the jar. And of course, matches. This could be the end of the video. No. Here we go. G'day and welcome back to RC Model Reviews. Another request video this time looking at nitro engines. Now, I hadn't realised, I'm so old that I hadn't realised there's a whole generation or two of people who have grown up solely flying electric models. They've never actually used an internal combustion engine on a radio controlled model aircraft. And yeah, I'm so old. It's incredible because we were brought up on these things. When I was young, electric just wasn't a thing. You just could not buy or buy an electric model. You couldn't build one because motors were, electric motors were way too heavy, the magnets were weak, and batteries were just like absolutely ridiculously poor compared to today's lithium batteries and neodymium magnets and the brushless motors that we now take for granted. So what I'm going to do today is take a little bit of a look at the difference between electric and nitro. I'm going to take a look at a few nitro motors and just see why so many people, especially older folk like me, uh, are so in love with nitro. What makes it so special? Right, let's start by taking a look at the average electric system. It's usually three main components. We have obviously an electric motor. That's essential, that's the motor, the electric motor. We have a speed controller and we have a battery. This is our energy source. This enables us to control the power of the motor and of course this provides the torque to turn the propeller which makes our aircraft fly. Now, virtually everyone is familiar with this now. We can get these motors in all sizes and shapes. We can get these ESCs in all sizes and shapes and we can get the batteries in all sizes and shapes. So it's pretty easy to set up a model by choosing the appropriate equipment. And there's not a lot to go wrong here. If your ESC fails, then you're in trouble. If your motor fails, you're in trouble if the battery fails. So, you know, it's, there are three points of failure in the system. And, but generally speaking, it's incredibly, incredibly reliable. The technology has advanced so much in recent years that these things just work so well. And that's why electric flight has become so very popular. Now let's take a look at the equivalent with a nitro setup. And here is the equivalent nitro setup. Not necessarily equivalent in power, but equivalent in terms of the functional elements. We have an engine. It's not a motor, it's an engine. We have a source of power, which is this fuel tank, which when filled with the appropriate fuel, allows the engine to make power. And you'll notice that this engine has a little arm on here, which goes backwards and forwards. That's the throttle. And we use a regular servo with a, an arm to that, gives us the equivalent of our ESC. So we've got the ability to control the power. We've got the ability to turn our uh, chemical fuel into rotational force torque. And we have a place to hold the chemical fuel. So those are the three elements. One could say that there's a fourth element, which is actually the fuel. But in terms of actually building a model, these are the three things you've got to put in to make a nitro system work. Now, the thing with electric is that most of, well, all electric motors operate on the same basic principles. And there's not a lot of difference between electric motors. Now, the, probably the biggest difference is in-runner versus out-runner. And an out-runner is where the magnets are usually on the outside and they turn. The magnets are the part that actually turns like this when your motor operates. Most of the motors we use in model fixed wing flying and multi-rotor wing flying are um, uh, outrunners. That's the outside of the motor turns. You can also get in-runners which are where the inside of the motor turns. The outside remains fixed and there's a rotor on the inside. It's an in-runner. More suited to high revolutions because obviously bigger bell at high RPM means there's more centrifugal force on those magnets. But suffice to say there's really not a lot of difference. They may look a bit different. They may be big, they may be small, but all brushless electric motors pretty much work the same way. And isn't that boring? Because if we go to the nitro side of things, there's a huge difference in how different motors are designed, the principles of operation, the size, the power, and the features that each individual design offer offers. So I'm going to show you a range of nitro motors now and discuss the differences. And here are a couple of nitro motors to show you. There's, there's an enormous variation in size, just like there is with electric motors. This is a 0.01 cubic inch, one, uh, what is it, one hundredth of a cubic inch, this motor. Um, that is so small. Look at it compared to the size of my hand. This is the Cox 010. These are actually a collector's item now. If you've seen my, uh, what is it, nitro powered little stick video, the review I did, I've flown a little model with this motor. They're wonderful. They do about 27, 30,000 RPM. Um, incredible little pieces of work. 
magnificent. And this, of course, is a 55. So this is a 0.55 cubic inch. This is a 100th. So this is a what is that, a half cubic inch. There's a fifth, this is 50 times more displacement than this, I think, if you work it out. I don't know, perhaps not. Yeah, it is, 50 times more displacement. <laughs> That's the range. And of course, you can get much bigger glow motors. Not so popular these days because gasoline motors have taken over. Used to be you could get Super Tiger motors up to 30 cc, up to 50 cc, I think it was, a 50 cc glow motor. Now, of course, anything above 10 cc is usually going to be uh, gas, spark ignition with gas. But there you go. So those are the difference. These are both two-stroke motors. They both have a carburetor up the front here because the timing of the intake charge is determined by the crankshaft. I'll get a crankshaft and I'll show you. But basically, these are almost the same design, just different in scale. But nitro motors aren't only different. They don't only offer a different range of sizes, but also wildly different techniques for making them work. Now, this, as I say, is a two-stroke engine, like you'd find in a, uh, a you know a motocross bike or perhaps a lawnmower, not so often these days because emission regulations means that even in America just about everything's four stroke now, but you know this is a typical ying ding ding engine that you find in older motorcycles and things. Uh, very simple operation, very reliable, not much to go wrong. This is, first of all I'll show you this one, this is a four stroke engine and as you can see it looks a lot different. It's got things that we'd recognize if you know anything about engines, you'll recognize some of the key things here. Now first of all, um, up here we have some rockers because Look at the front. There's some push rods here, just like um, just like some of the motorcycle engines you may recall. I think was it um, Harley Davidson had something that looked pretty similar to this. These are the push rods that go up and down. They're driven by a cam inside here. You can see this big semicircle. That's a gear that rides on the crankshaft. So this means the camshaft operates at half the speed of the crankshaft, and the little cam lobes in there operate the push rods, which go up here, operate the rockers, which use which push in and out little poppet valves. Here is the head of a four-stroke engine, as you can see, a uh, couple of poppet valves. We've got an intake valve and an exhaust valve. So uh, the rockers normally sit here, and as the push rod comes up, it pushes down on the poppet valve, which, as you can see, opens just like in a car engine or any other four-stroke to allow the, in this take, the intake gas to come in, and on this side, the exhaust gas to go out. So, yeah, they're just like a, uh, any other four-stroke. This is a Saito, Saito 82 which is about 11 and a half cc's, I think, 0.82 cubic inches. And you'll notice also it has an intake manifold down here to a carburetor. And just like on the other one, it has a little arm here for varying the throttle. This one has a Venturi stack on it. Uh, and here's the exhaust side here. So you can see easily that the intake gas is coming through this valve and the exhaust gas is going out through that valve. Now, um, you notice this muffler is all crusty and horrible and brown. Why is that? Well, I'll talk a bit more about that when I get onto fuels, nitro fuels, but that's a four-stroke, but I'm going to show you another four-stroke. Let's turn this around here. Here is another four-stroke. And despite the very similar sizes, this is actually much smaller. This is only a 49. This is an 82. This is a 49. So this is 0.82 cubic inches, 0.49 cubic inches. But this is a totally different looking four-stroke. You notice there's no rockers on the top. There's no push rods. How the hell does this work? Well, let me explain to you. If you look at this motor, we'll see a shaft running up in here. This isn't a push rod, this is a rotating shaft. It's driven by bevel gears from the crankshaft, which runs through here. The bevel gears mean that as the crankshaft turns, this shaft also rotates. And on the top here, there is another set of gears, because inside there, there is a head, or a top of the combustion chamber, which also rotates. So this combustion chamber rotates at half the speed of the crankshaft. So if we look at it, we have, and it rotates this way. So there's a hole in the top of the rotating combustion chamber head which through which the inlet gases can flow into the cylinder and then as the piston goes down it sucks them in as the piston goes up again this is rotating so it closes off that intake port and we get compression occurring in the cylinder this continues to rotate round then we get combustion here's the glow plug and I'll talk more about glow plugs in a moment there's the glow plug which ignites the, the fuel, air fuel mixture and the cylinder, or the, sorry, the piston then starts heading down again. Meanwhile, this is still rotating, so that the hole that we have was lined up with here is rotated around, rotated around, and by the time the piston gets to the bottom of the combustion stroke, that hole will have lined up with the exhaust port. So as the piston comes up again, it pushes all the exhaust gases out through the hole in the top of the combustion chamber at the exhaust pipe, and then of course the whole cycle repeats. So this is what's called an Aspen rotary valve engine, and. Variations on this have been used many, many times over the years, even in World War II aircraft. Some of the engines on them had rotating um, 
valve systems like this one. And that's what makes it so exciting. This is a completely different engine to that. Even though they're both four-stroke model aircraft engines, they run on the same fuel and they work on a four-stroke principle, but the mechanism by which that's implemented is completely different. And these engines have totally different characteristics. This is a very powerful engine with an excellent power to weight ratio. This is an incredibly quiet engine. It's gutless as anything. It wouldn't pull the skin off a rice pudding, but it just, it ticks, it runs like a sewing machine. It's so quiet. There's no valve clearances to worry about making ticking noises or rattling. So it runs very quietly. And because it's not very powerful, the exhaust gas pressures are pretty low. So it's, it's not making a lot of noise out of the exhaust either. Uh, you don't get this with electric. I mean, this is the variety of engines. I'm going to show you another one. The, 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 you know, the fun never ends. So those are two four stroke engines. But here's another two stroke engine. This is a pylon racing engine from the 1980s. Again, it's an OS engine. So it was one of the top engines of its day. It is a 40 size. So it is half the size of this four stroke. And these things at their peak put out about one and a half to two horsepower. Really, really, and they did it at very high RPM. How did they do that? Well, I'm gonna show you. Let's first of all take a look at the intake on this engine. Here's the carburetor, if I open that up, see how much, see how the size of the hole to allow the air and fuel into the motor. And remember that goes into the crankshaft here through there. So we actually have, I've got a crankshaft here. You can see that if I line this crankshaft up, you can see there is a, this is not the right crankshaft for this motor, but there's a hole here. So as the crankshaft rotates, it opens that hole to the intake, allows the air and fuel to be sucked into the crankcase. And then as it rotates past, closes that off so that when the piston comes down, it compresses in the crankcase and it squirts up past the piston into the cylinder. But that's the porting there. And you see, there's a hole in there that limits the amount of fuel that can flow as well. So with these front induction engines, you, you're pretty limited by your crankshaft and that poses a bit of a problem. So what they did when they wanted more power was they said, well, let's put the intake on the back because that means we can use a much bigger intake. Look at the size of this intake. Look at the size of that. Now compare it to the OS 55. Remember, this is only a 40. This is a 55. Look at the difference in size. So this engine can suck a lot more air and fuel into the motor. So it produces a lot more power. Notice though, there's no throttle arm on this motor. It doesn't have a throttle. This is designed solely for power, which means we don't need no stinking throttle. These engines had a, uh, some, some of them had a fuel cutoff. Other just, others of them just were run until they ran out of fuel. But they were so powerful, they were the engine of the day for high performance models like pylon races. But again, it looks so much different to that engine. So we've got this massive variety. It's not just in runners and out runners, it's four strokes, two strokes, Aspen rotary valves, poppet valves, front induction, rear induction, rear exhaust, front exhaust, you know, side exhaust. It's amazing. So this is why I, well, I and many other people love nitro motors so much. You can have so much fun just looking at the damn things. Now, of course, these engines weren't called nitro engines when I was a lad. They were called glow plug engines because in the top of the cylinder, a small glow plug is inserted. That little glow plug has a coil of wire, special wire. It's platinum based alloy of platinum, and that has some unique characteristics. If you expose platinum to warm vapors of methanol, it will actually glow red hot. It's a catalytic reaction that causes the platinum to oxidize, sorry, not causes the methanol to oxidize, which like slow burning, and that heats up the platinum wire. So what happens is once the motor's running, that little coil of wire in the head of the motor stays hot enough to ignite the fuel when the piston comes up to the top. And of course you get that hot by putting a glow starter battery on it before you flick the motor over and get it running. Simple as. Used to be glow motors were really hard to start. These days, they start so easily, it's just not an issue. You know, one of the negatives that electric flyers often paint of the nitro, um, nitro motors is they're hard to start. Well, it's not true. Um, if, my, if I have a glow plug motor or a nitro motor and it doesn't start within three or four flicks, I know something's wrong. The glow plug's not getting hot, it's faulty, or there's not enough fuel getting through to the motor, and those can be easily remedied. Very rarely these days do I have to use an electric starter, except perhaps on a four-stroke engine or one that's too big to safely swing the prop by hand. But anyway, so these were glow plug motors in our day, and they were called, you know, we, we ran them on fuel that consisted of about 20% oil, usually castor oil, and 80% methanol. And methanol is just a form of alcohol. Sometimes it's called wood alcohol. It is a light, relatively odorless, clear liquid that burns quite well. Um, a bit like gasoline, really. But uh, as I said, now they're called nitro motors. Why? Why are they called nitro motors? Well, I'll show you why. This is why. It's a bottle of nitromethane. It's not just regular nitromethane. It's laboratory-grade nitromethane. This is the real deal, the real McCoy. Look, dangerous. 
there you go, splody stuff, burny stuff, be careful, don't touch. Um, and there it is. Now the chemical formula for nitromethane is CH3NO2 and that's important because I'll, well, I'll tell you why it's important in a moment, but nitromethane as a fuel absolutely sucks. It's got very much less energy per gram of fuel or per ounce of fuel than either gasoline or methanol. It's really an energy low fuel. It doesn't produce as much energy per unit of, that you burn. So why would you use such a crappy fuel to get more power? How the hell does that work? Well, let me explain for a moment. In order for a fuel to burn, it has to be mixed with an oxidizer, usually air. So you need a certain amount of fuel and a certain amount of air. And if you don't get the ratio right, then it doesn't burn properly, or sometimes it doesn't burn at all. That's why we tune an engine by adjusting the mixture. If it's too lean, it runs too hot and might even stop. If it's too rich, it runs roughly and there's lots of smoke and it burbles and carries on. So we need to find the ideal ratio of air to fuel, the ideal mixture. And that is called the stoic ratio, stoic actually, but quite often it's just abbreviated to stoic, the stoic ratio. And different fuels have different stoic ratios. Different fuels need different amounts of air to burn properly. And so if we get our gasoline engine, for every unit of fuel, we need about 15 units of air. And this is by weight. So if you have an ounce of fuel, it'll take 15 ounces of air to balance that amount of fuel to get a nice combustible mixture. Which means on most of these motors or these engines, we're limited by the amount of air we can suck in. Remember that air intake there? That limits the amount of air, you know, the, the, the pumping efficiency of the motor limits the amount of air that can be sucked in. It's easy to squirt heaps of fuel in, but it's the air that is the limiting factor. So if we're dealing with a fixed amount of air, we can't suck any more, then obviously if you like gasoline that needs lots of air, we can only use a little bit of it. Otherwise we'd have too much gasoline, not enough air, and it would run crappily. So uh, gasoline runs at a much lower stoic ratio than other fuels. Now if we go to methanol, most people know that if you run a methanol fueled engine, it's got more power, an alcohol fueled engine, more power than a gas engine. But the interesting thing is that alcohol has less energy per unit than gasoline. So how can we get more power out of a fuel that has less energy per unit? Well, again, it's because alcohol has a different stoic ratio. Gasoline requires 15 units of air per unit of fuel. So we can't use much if our air flow is the restricting factor. Methanol only requires eight units of air per unit of fuel. So it means for a given amount of air, we can push a lot more methanol into the motor. And even though it has less energy per unit, because we can push twice as much into it, we get more power overall, simple as. So alcohol fueled motors run more powerfully than gas fueled motors. And if we get to nitromethane, this one, it, this is really an extreme condition. Now, gasoline, 15 to one, methanol, eight to one. Guess what this runs? less than two to one, it's about 1.8 I think, so for every unit of nitromethane, we only need two units of air. Woohoo, how's that? So that means if we're, for a, for a fixed amount of air, we can squirt through four times as much of nitromethane as we can of methanol, and eight times, of eight times as much nitromethane as we could gasoline. So even though we're getting less per unit, we're putting so much more in that overall the power just is increased dramatically. That's why we use nitromethane, because we can get more of it into the motor for a given amount of air, and that means more power. And so why can we do that? That's a good question. Why is it that nitromethane doesn't need so much air to burn? Well, look at the chemical formula again. CH3NO2, the O2 is the important part. Now most fuels like gasoline and methanol don't carry their own oxygen. They require oxygen from the air to burn. Nitromethane has two atoms of oxygen per molecule of nitromethane. That means that it's actually carrying some of its own oxidizer. It's got its own air in there basically. So we don't need as much external air. And that is why nitromethane can burn at such a, a, a low stoic or such a high stoic, low stoic ratio. It needs very little air. Now what this means is of course that it's also quite a dangerous substance because we have the two parts of an explosion in the one bottle. To have an explosion you need a fuel and you need an oxidizer. Normally that's a fuel like gasoline and an oxidizer like air which contains oxygen. When you have them both in the same substance then you've got to be careful because if you treat this badly they'll combine and you get an explosion. That's why it has the splody label on the side. Um, so you might think, "Woo, got to be careful, don't hold a naked flame near this. Well, it's not really true actually. Um, yes, it is very dangerous. Yes, it can uh, cause an explosion. But interestingly enough, let's look at what happens if I pour some of this nitromethane, lab grade nitromethane, into a little dish 
and throw a lighted match into it. Place your bets now whether this video will continue. All right, here we go. Nitromethane, woo, let's pour a bit in here. Just enough to cover the bottom of the jar. And of course, matches. This could be the end of the video. No. Here we go. Ah, it's gone out. Okay, let's try the same thing with methanol. This is just methanol. And as I say, the vapor pressure of methanol is, well, the, is significantly different. So we'll just put a little bit of methanol in here. Don't want to crack too much of a fire. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to throw a match in there. You watch what happens. There's a purple flame in there. You see the flame burning away? That's what happens when you... Methanol creates enough vapour to sustain the combustion. Nitromethane, there was a bit of a flash, but there was no continued combustion because there's just not enough vapour being formed. There you go. Wasn't that a disappointment? <laughs> of course it was a disappointment. The interesting thing about nitromethane is it has a very low vapour, or very, very little vapour is emitted from the liquid itself. And it's only vapour that burns. It's something to remember. Vapour is the only thing that burns. Liquids don't burn. Liquids don't burn, but they do release vapours that burn. And because nitromethane at normal temperatures and pressures doesn't release much vapour, it's very hard to ignite. Because, as I say, no vapour, no flame. Gasoline, on the other hand, releases vapours very readily at normal temperatures and pressures. So if you hold a lighted match over a pail of gasoline, you're going to get a, fl you're going to get a fire, you're going to get woof and flames everywhere. Same with methanol. Methanol releases a lot of vapour. Nitromethane? Not so much. And that means that nitromethane as a fuel also requires special uh, considerations in terms of compression ratio and forms of ignition. So a model aircraft engine, a glow motor, surprisingly enough, will run very poorly on, without any methanol. If you tried to run an engine solely on oil and nitromethane, one of these model airplane engines, it'd run like crap because it wouldn't have the catalytic reaction from the, plat from the methanol and platinum to keep the glow plug hot. And also, there may not be enough heat in that filament to even ignite the nitromethane because of the vapour, the very limited vapour it exudes. In the case of um, nitro dragsters, they have massive ignition systems that have huge amounts of energy going into the spark plugs and, and usually more than one spark plug because it's so hard to damn well ignite the nitromethane. And so, yeah, it's, as a fuel, as I say, it's not that fantastic, but as an additive, as an additive to our model fuels, it can give us quite significant power increases. Typically, you increase the power of the engine by an amount equal to the percentage of nitromethane. So if you have an engine with no nitromethane and you add 10% nitromethane, you're going to get 10% more power. Add 20%, you get 20% more power. It doesn't scale that linearly though, because if you reach a point where you put too much nitromethane in, bits fly off the engine and you get no power. So you've got to know when to say enough. In most cases, most engines like 5 to 10%, they're quite happy at that. If you run too much nitromethane, they will detonate, they'll pre-ignite, like pinking in your vehicle and damage will occur. But good engines, especially high compression ones, will run fine without any of this damn nitro at all. Right, so we've talked about why we need some methanol, talked about why we, it's, it's beneficial sometimes to have nitromethane. What about oil? Of course we need oil. You've got to have oil to stop these things from seizing up, to lubricate the moving parts. And as with most two strokes, the oil is in the fuel. But interestingly enough, even in the four strokes, the oil is still in the fuel. These don't have a crankcase full of oil like your regular four-stroke car engine might have, they have oil in the fuel. And because it's just impractical to have a crankcase full of oil and have an oil pump at the size of motor. So they just put oil in the fuel. And what happens is these four-stroke engines are almost always ringed. So when you have the air and fuel being compressed in here and it ignites, you get blow by. So some oil and fuel is blown past the gap in the rings into the crankcase. And that accumulates and provides a, a reservoir of oil that sits there. It's so another reason why they have this little vent on the bottom here, this little nipple there. That's just to let the blow-by pressure bleed out from the crankcase. Otherwise, the crankcase would pressurise and there wouldn't be any more oil pushed in there. So virtually all four strokes have this little nipple here. There's one on this engine and here's one on the Saito engine. You can see one there. That's just to let the crankcase pressure 
that's produced by the blow pass, the blow by on the rings, um, escape. Otherwise, you have big problems. You never block off that nipple. Otherwise, the motor will generally fail, seize up, and die. So we have oil and fuel mixed together. Oil and methanol and nitromethane mixed together used to be in the old days, as I said. We ran 20% oil and it was castor oil because that's all we really had. And the trouble is castor oil produces this nasty gumming up on the hot parts of the motor and even on the head. That's castor oil residue. Um, these days, uh, there are some good synthetics out there. Um, we've got Aerosave, Aerosynth and a whole lot of other good synthetics. Not that flash, not that impressed by cool power, I've got to say, when it comes to oils. It, it's not the best synthetic on the market. It's well marketed. A lot of people use it, don't have too much trouble, but it's not really the best. One of the problems I found with Cool Power is that the, the um, protection package in the oil is not very good because if you're running this stuff, interestingly enough, you run this stuff, nitromethane, one of the byproducts of combustion then becomes nit uh, nit nitric acid. Because if we look at the chemical formula, it's got NO2, NO2, and nitric acid is HNO3. So we need another atom of oxygen and a hydrogen, and of course there's some hydrogen in there as well, CH3. CH3. So there's three atoms of hydrogen, um, nitrogen and oxygen. Those are all the things you need to make nitric acid. So um, after you've run these motors, there's a very low pH in the crankcase, or in these ones, in the crankcase, uh, because of the nitric acid that's been formed as a byproduct of combustion. And if you don't have something in the oil to protect the steel parts, they will rust. And my goodness, I've seen some really rusty engines uh, that have been run on cool power, just hung up and put away. You've got to use an after-run oil if you want maximum protection if you're running nitro. After-run oil is something that will cling to the metal surfaces, displace the moisture and the nitric acid and protect them from rust. Um, I've been using Aerosave and Aerosynth. They are European oils. They seem to have a really good package. And this engine has never had after-run oil that crankcase is crankshafts out of. Look at that. There's no rust on that. A little tiny bit of patina on the back there. But the rest of the thing, perfect, no rust at all, because it's such a fantastic oil, it protects long after the engine has been running. Um, cool power, not so much, but hey, this is a, it's almost a religious thing, this whole oil thing, so I'm not getting into that debate. But again, I use a high quality oil at low ratios. Now, it used to be 20% was the oil ratio you ran. These days, using cool power, a lot of people are running like 17%. I run 12%. 12% oil is all I run um, in all my motors, and it provides, I've never had a lubrication related mechanical failure. I've had other failures, you've seen the video of engines I've had that have blown up, not due to lubrication failure, simply due to other issues such as metal fatigue and so forth, but lubrication never been an issue. The good advantage of synthetics of course is they don't cause all this gumming up, they don't cause all this gunge on the muffler, your motors remain pretty damn clean. So there you go, um, now that's probably enough for one video, probably bored the pants off you, but if you want more on nitro engines I can show you installing, setting up, tuning if you want to see it, and we can compare flying with nitro to flying with electric. But as I say, it's just so different, it's so much fun, it lets you get your hands dirty, because yeah, if you're running 12% oil, you're going to have greasy hands at the end of it, and that's part of the fun. You'll never get a rusty aeroplane if you fly nitro. As simple as that. <laughs> so there you go. Thank you for watching this video. If you've got questions, comments, put them in the usual place. And now I will clear the bench, get on with something else. But there will be more in the Nitro series if you want it. Tell me if you do. Bye for now.